Today, we're sharing five nuggets of wisdom from a brand new course at SBL called Rhythm Section Development Part 2 with the incredible drummer Steve Gould. Steve has played live and on records with the likes of Corey Wong, Owl City, Sarah Bareilles, Gavin DeGraw, Carly Rae Jepsen, Need to Breathe, Matt Carney, Ben Rector, the list goes on and on. Dude knows what he's talking about. Have you ever wondered what a drummer thinks your role should be as a bass player? Well, besides loading in the gear. I'm gonna speak to bass players about their instrument from my perspective as a drummer. But I also kind of want to invite the bass players to think about my instrument and understand a little more about the way the drums work because we have such a teamwork thing going on here. Yes, we're in a relationship. We have to be in agreement. Exactly. Yeah. And understanding where each other's roles fit is key to that. So it's not so much that you're going to be talking about what you want to hear from the bass or from the bass role, right? But like how you feel like the bass player needs to listen to what's happening in the drums. Okay, so vocalist, lyrics, melody, guitars and keys are doing chord progressions and timbre, tonal landscape. What is the bass job? I don't know. Oh gosh, well let me- <laughs> I, I want you to tell me. Here's what I think. It, to me, it feels like the bass player's job is low end mm. and root notes. Now again, the guitar player can play low notes but it's almost like the bass was uniquely designed for- Right, right? to like, set the bottom of a chord progression, yeah. right? Or to like define the motion of the progression of the tune. Those, th those strings are thick. Right. And, and, <laughs> and they like resonate. Yes. And you're, you're providing this EQ foundation. Uh, the root note sounds best when it comes from something that has a lot of low end, right? setting the foundation of the chord, but the whole mix sounds best when low end is present and kind of like carrying along, sustaining. I, I've got low end here with my kick drum, but it's gone. Right. It's like as soon as I play it once, it's gone. You have no like note length. Right. Versus, you just, yeah. Oh, there right. it is. There's, there's length with the note, or there can be. Right. Helps the vocalist get their pitch reference, helps the listener form the foundation of the chord progression the triad and all that stuff. Yeah. So I would give you the jobs of low end and root notes. And then I love that because, and and here's the thing, I don't want anyone to feel like you're confining the bass players to only those roles, right? I don't want people to hear you say that. I want to hear, or I, I feel like I'm hearing you say, that needs to be taken care of as the priority. Because if you don't do those things, no one else can't, can't, is no well one, suited. The, the idea behind the band member roles isn't, like you said, building walls around what you're allowed to do. Right. It's highlighting what you are uniquely equipped to do better than else, better than anyone else in the band. The vocalist can do the lyrics and the melody better than anyone else. The, the guitar player can do the tonal landscape and the chord progression better. And you as the bass player can handle the low end and the root notes with more efficiency and more effectiveness than, than anybody you. else. Right, right. That's why I want you to do that job. Right. But in the moment where you decide to pass off the root, like maybe you decide I'm not gonna play any root notes over the bridge and the bridge is gonna feel a little different because root notes are coming from the keyboard player or sure. something. Or perhaps you're like, I'm not gonna bring any low end in during the first verse or the pre-chorus. If I play anything, it's gonna be upper register stuff saving the entrance of low end at all for the first chord. But that idea like presupposes that I understand my role. Exactly. Right? right. Like, like then, then it's about choices and intent. Mm -hmm. I'm making choices around, okay, I'm gonna provide low end in these moments and then I'm not going to in these moments so that we feel this, oh, uh, I'm like, we're lifting off the ground. There's something not grounded. And then here comes that last chorus and I'm gonna go back to my role. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. I like that a lot. Great, okay, good. <laughs> I mean, I don't wanna tell you what your job is. You're the bass player, but yeah. it's certainly from my seat. My, that's my perspective. Yeah. Your job. Hey, do me a favor, check and make sure that you're subscribed to the channel, like the video, it really helps us out and it ensures that you won't miss a thing. This next tip contains a syncopation exercise that if you learn, it will change your playing forever. From one, next time around, E of one, I'm gonna play all the hi-hat notes with you. Okay. Uh, so that you can hear all the counts. Yeah. So we can both hear all the counts and then I'll, I'll hit with you on the kick drum. Great. Yep. Three E and a, four E and a.
Okay. We're working our way across. Yeah. We get all the way to the end. Yes. The last one is the uh of four. Yep. And then the next time around, we're just going backwards. So the next time we'd go to the and of four. Yes. And then the E of e, four and yep. then four. Great. And that's a little more difficult just working backwards. It's actually, the whole exercise is difficult because in between each count you hit, you have to cycle through all the other counts. And it's just this game of space, right? Like yes. thinking about the space. Right, and and I can't, I, <laughs> as I'm doing it, I'm imagining myself just looking down like the crosshairs yeah. and trying to aim for each one of these, but I've got to pay attention to all the ones that I'm not hitting. Right, like, sure. So that I hit the correct one. It's, yeah. it's a bunch of like mental monitoring. And I really can't look up from that. Of course. Okay, let's let's go all the way across. And back? And back. You ready? <laughs> yes. Let's go kind of fast so we don't take forever to do this. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Three and a four and a four. Shoot. It was like home stretch. And I felt that and I got intimidated. And honestly, like the intimidation, I took my eye off the ball. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So again, to reiterate, this exercise is not easy. Absolutely. And when you're going that fast, the, the difficulty compounds on itself. Of course. Give me another chance. Of course. Let's, let's go at let's go at two. Let's start at start at two and work our way back to one. Love it. Okay. Yeah. Three and a four again. <laughs> okay, I, I noticed just now with your kick, but even at a few other points in the in the uh, the cycle, you kind of like leaned into the count. Sure. Which is what happens physically when we start to recognize these feelings. Yeah, when you start like, to get comfortable. You right? know what four feels like. <laughs> yeah, right. And so you can feel it coming. Yeah. And you even kind of like physically manifest it. Sure. In a way that's, it, it's not just like beep, 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 boom, right? Like, like you can like kind of get in there. Yes. And that's what I want you doing with my kick drum hits. Yeah, right. In the rhythm section together. I want you feeling the same thing I'm feeling. Right. These counts aren't there to make you think about something other than the feel. Understanding these counts via this exercise and really starting to like recognize everything and become familiar, those counts are just helping you to qu more quickly access the feel. So are you enjoying these nuggets of wisdom? Do you know that this is from an entire course? There's also a part one. They are exclusively available at SBL. And lucky for you, we're running a promotion right now where you can get $50 off an annual membership. I know, it's a good deal. The link is gonna be right here, also in the description. Take the free 14-day trial, decide if SBL is right for you, and get $50 off your annual membership. To play or not to play with the kick drum? The eternal question. Feel the juxtaposition of just the eighth notes versus just the sixteenth notes, but all cycling within the same measure. Over right, the and I mean, in that instinct, what I, well, in that instance, what I feel like my instinct would be would be to leave that a figure because it sounds like uh, it sounds like a drum figure, and I don't know that I want to lock up with it. Mm, you cool. know, yeah. Like, what if play that for me? Would Three, you? four. That's so hip. I like that a lot. <laughs> right, because then it like it almost features that pattern. Yeah. Right. Now, if I were to play all of it with you, three, four. That's 
cool. Yeah. It's heavier all of a sudden. Right. It seems more sort of like a wash. Mm -hmm. But choosing to let go and not play kick drums, right? Right. Uh, and just highlight certain ones. Because that with that amount of syncopation, I almost want to let it be a feature, like a drum feature. I love that. I think that sounded great. Yeah, cool. Everybody talks about playing with the kick drum. Can you play with the snare? Oh, wouldn't it be cool to do a groove that was that was just on snares? I mean, I played with kicks too, but will you play that one more time? Three, four. I mean, and that feels so fun. It feels locked in a different way, right? I mean, I'm I'm acknowledging beat one with a low note, mm -hmm. um, which is anchor, kick drum, but then I'm choosing to forget about the kick drums and just play with the snare, mm -hmm. right? But because we're in agreement and because we know where those are, where those are lining up in the bar, it works. Look, we've been talking a lot about the kick and snare. Does the hi-hat matter? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it this time with 16ths on the hi-hat. Sure. Feel all that. I love that I love that you added a note with my snare drum. That's yeah. totally fine. Right. It feels different when you add in with a snare than when you add in with one of my kicks, but both are great choices. And acceptable, right? Yes. We just wonder how it needs to feel, right? And I will say, when you went to 16s there on the hi-hat, mm -hmm. it made me wonder about syncopating a little more with you. Yep. It sure. almost like gave me permission. What so, happens when I go only quarter notes on the hi-hat? All right. Ready? Three, yep. four. Length. And listen, that's a perfect example of why the hi-hat matters. I'm not trying to say the hi-hat doesn't matter. Right. But the, the detail of the kick and the snare is the thing that really impacts the listener first. Right. That's my theory. That's where that's where I'm usually working from. The kick and snare is where I start. Then I decide how the hi-hats are gonna fit yeah. on top of that. It affects how you dance. Yeah. How you feel the groove. Yep. Yeah. Big thanks to Steve Gould for being a boss. Check out the entire series of rhythm section development featuring Steve Gould exclusively at scottspacelessons.com. Remember to grab that free trial, and if you become a member, save $50 on your annual membership. <gasps> I have been Ian Martin Allison. See you in the next one.